what does it mean to be a disciple? Who is a disciple? What is a snapshot of a disciple? If you are taking notes, write this down. And I like my points always to have the same starting letter. Just one of the, it's a tenth gift of the Holy Spirit that was discovered way later after apostles passed away. <laughs> I'm just kidding by the way. It's a joke. The first mark of a disciple is his diet. They feed on the scriptures. The second snapshot of a disciple is a devotion, is they follow the Holy Spirit. The third one is discipline, is they forsake sin. The fourth one is discipleship, is they fish for souls and they also feed lambs. Or in other words, they disciple others. I'm going to read the verse Mark chapter 1 verse 17 and verse 18. Then Jesus said to them, follow me and I will make you fishers of men immediately they left their nets and followed him i want you to see the three f's in there follow forsake and fish follow forsake and fish before i break those uh, things down i would like you to read one more verse john chapter 8 verse 31 then jesus said to the jews who believed in him if you abide in my word you are my disciples indeed if you are taking notes, write this down. Disciple feeds on the Holy Scriptures. So disciple feeds on the Holy Scriptures. It's very difficult to be led by the Holy Spirit if you are led by horoscopes. It's very difficult. Now believers can feed you know on whatever they want to feed on because they their mark is they believe in Jesus. What makes somebody a disciple? Jesus says if you abide in my word. What does that look like? It's what for some of us looks like being on Fox News. When you abide in it. You have the app. You follow the news every day. You read stuff every day. You live in it. And then you get possessed with a political spirit. Because everything is about politics. So a disciple is not somebody who feeds on Fox News. Disciple is not somebody who feeds on CNN. Disciple, Jesus says, if you abide in my word. Some Christians have become disciples of Republican Party instead of Jesus Christ. Because it's not his word. They're like, well, I've read it, but I really need to see what is new in the world. There is nothing new in the world. People are killing each other. People are gossiping. People are hating each other. And there's nothing new there. But what we see in God's word is new life. And the Bible says a disciple. So the first mark of disciple is he feeds. Not he reads. He feeds on God's word. It's more than reading God's word. He feeds on it. As Christians, we don't read the Bible to learn the Bible. We read the Bible to learn obedience. Hebrews chapter 5 verse 8, it says the following. Though he was a son, yet he learned obedience through the things that he suffered. The Bible is not given to us to learn. It was given to us to live. The Word of God is not given so you and I can get a degree, so you and I can be disciples. The Word of God is not given to us to improve our knowledge box and fill it with information. It was to improve our life, our life and our love and to improve our life. Because you can go to college and learn how to manage somebody's hedge fund and not know how to manage your attitude. You can go to university and learn how to fix cars but you will not know how to fix your mouth. You can go to college and learn how to fix somebody's teeth and have three marriages. Because colleges teach you a skill. Bible teaches you life. It teaches you relationships. It teaches you finances. It teaches you how to run your mouth properly. It teaches you how to run your finances properly. It gives you something to live by, not just something to learn. It's very important that we understand that. The reason why is because Jesus says in Matthew chapter 28 verse 19, He says this, go into all the world, make disciples of all nations, baptize them in the water in the name of the Father, Son and the Holy Spirit. And then He says this, He says, teach them to observe all the things I taught you. I want you to notice what He did not say. He did not say, teach them to learn what I taught you. He did not say, teach them so that they know what I taught you. We don't learn to fill our head with knowledge. We learn 
so that we can apply it and live it. Most Christians are educated beyond their level of obedience. Beyond their level of obedience. The moment you overfeed physically and you don't exercise what you put into the body, it leads to obesity. There is such a thing in the Western world called spiritual obesity. It's when you read it to learn instead of obey. We go to colleges and you learn six years of university of Bible colleges and everything but the problem is that person's life is empty void of the fruit the gifts and the power of the Holy Spirit because the Bible is not given to increase our information but to produce transformation in our life if you abide in my word Jesus didn't say if you memorize it I believe in memorizing the Bible Jesus did not say if you don't lose the streaks on the YouVersion Bible app. I'm committed to the streaks on the YouVersion Bible app. Jesus did not say if you read it and know it in Hebrew and in Greek. He said if you practice it, if you do it. He rebuked people by saying if you just go, uh, James I think is the one who said if you only read but you don't do what it says. You're like a person who went to the mirror and looked at it but forgot how your face looked and you walked away being the same. My wife has a dog. His name is Jacko. He just broke a thousand followers on Instagram. It was a huge celebration for him. A few times during the week when my wife uh, would leave to do some activities, she would give me a command. Very simple command. Feed Jacko. Two words. This happened this week. Now imagine my wife left. She coming back. She came back and she said, did you feed Jacko? And I said, well, I memorized what you told me. It's feed Jacko. In fact, I even learned it in Russian. Pokarmi Jacko. By the way, I even learned it in Spanish. Alimentar Jacko. I, uh, I got a small group going on how to feed Jacko. I really, I memorized it. In fact, I even put it on a sticky note because it really gives me a lot of pleasure reading what you told me. She would look at me and she says, well that is awesome. Did you feed him? Oh no, no, I didn't feed him. I just, I learned the words that you gave me. See, when God gives us a word, it's not only so we can memorize it. Get a Bible study group so we can discuss how to apply it. God wants us to do it. Love your neighbor is not something you need to memorize. You just need to love your neighbor. To forgive your enemies is not just something you need to learn in different languages and post on Instagram. You just need to forgive your neighbor. A disciple is not somebody who studies the word so that they could know the word. They study the word so they can live the word. That is the difference. What makes somebody a disciple is they no longer see this as just food that feeds them. A mirror that tells them who they are. That this is not just a seed that produces fruit in their life. It's not just a sword against the devil. It's not just a hammer to break the spiritual opposition. But this becomes something that they obey. Have you been educated beyond your obedience? Do you need to maybe slow down on the amount that you read and raise up the amount that you do? Of this word. Disciple is not someone who loves the word. It's someone who loves the Lord. I don't see in the Bible God commending us to love the Bible. But the Bible commands us to love God. People say, I love my Bible. That is awesome. Do you love God? Because Pharisees love the Bible too. And when God showed up, they killed him. Don't fall in love with the Bible. Bible is given to you so you fall in love with God and a disciple is somebody who uses the Bible to fall in love with God. Please don't understand I'm not saying you should hate your Bible. Love your, of course love your Bible. Find a good version. Find a really nice one. Color it. Make it beautiful. Make it nice. Please fall in love with your Bible but never at the expense of falling in love with God because the first commandment is thou shall not love your King James Version Bible. The first commandment is thou shall not love you version Bible and all the things that you can do on it. The first commandment is thou shall love the Lord your God and it's not even the second commandment that thou shall love your Bible. The second commandment is thou shall love the person you currently dislike, your neighbor. 
my friend this is a challenge to all of us the Bible you know what before I got married me and my wife lived in a, in a different city in Vancouver Washington and we were separated by three and a half hour drive an iPhone just came up during that pretty much season of our life and um, I remember I got my wife an, an iPhone I had an iPhone and we text we started to text a lot in fact before I met her my text messages a month were about 700 to 800 a month the first month that I met her my text message went from 700 to 9,000 it wasn't because I discovered text messaging it was because and it wasn't because I fell in love with SMS it's because I fell in love with the person and texting was the way we expressed our love to each other I was not in love with the iPhone I was in love with Lana my friend God's Word is a text message God lives in there you live in here and he sends a text message every single day and God wants you to open it God wants you to communicate to him through his word but please understand do not miss the point it's not about texting it's about lover and his name is Jesus Christ disciple loves the Lord more than he loves the word can somebody say amen number two disciple follows the Holy Spirit so number one he feeds on the Holy Scriptures so that he can live the Holy Scriptures and the second one is the he follows the Holy Spirit we've read in here follow me and I will make you the fishers of men Jesus says in John chapter 14 verse 16 I will pray the Father and he will give you another helper that he may abide with you forever can somebody say another another in Greek means allos there is two different words for another in Greek. The one that is talking about is alos and the other one is heretos. Heretos means another kind. Like for example, you are fixing a car and the wrench didn't fit and you're telling your friends, hey, could you give me another wrench? Meaning it's a total different kind. Alos means the same kind. You're eating a sandwich and you order and say, can I get another sandwich? Meaning the same one that I just had. So Jesus is saying to his disciples, he says, the Father will send you another, just like me, comforter. So what disciples had with Jesus, you can have with the Holy Spirit. Disciples lived, walked, talked and fellowship with Jesus every day of their life and Jesus saying another meaning exactly like me except available to every person on the planet of the earth is going to come. A disciple is not just somebody who speaks in tongues. They live. They follow the Holy Spirit the same way disciples follow Jesus. My friend, we live in an era that is no different than the era disciples lived in because we have an access to someone, another who is with us, but it's our choice to follow. Because when Jesus was on this earth, not everybody followed. Some admired. Some only got healed by him. Some got delivered by him. But there were some that, be, that became disciples. The second mark of a disciple of Jesus Christ is not only that they live the Word of God, they follow the person of the Holy Spirit. They understand the Holy Spirit is not tongues, He's not power, He's not Baramazda Shara Barahanda. The Holy Spirit is not, you know, shaking and baking. The Holy Spirit is not oil. The Holy Spirit is not miracles. The Holy Spirit is a person. And He is to me what disciples were, Jesus was to the disciples. I can know Him intimately. I can talk to Him. I can be led by Him. I can hear His voice. I can say good morning Holy Spirit. I can say good evening Holy Spirit. I have the same relationship disciples had with Jesus. With another Jesus, the Holy Spirit. So... A disciple is somebody who intimately knows and follows the Holy Spirit. Disciples were not perfect when they followed Jesus. Nor will you be when you follow the Holy Spirit. But after following, you will be perfected. You will be changed. Now the secret here is Holy Spirit wants to be to you what Jesus was to the disciples. Listen to this very carefully. Holy Spirit wants to be to you what Jesus was to the disciples. Every believer hears the Holy Spirit but it takes a disciple to heed the Holy Spirit. What does it mean to actually follow where he's going? Have you ever followed somebody on the road? How many of you know it means keeping up with them? How many of you know that means sometimes speeding, sometimes uh, slowing down? It's making sure nobody gets in between of you. 
And if they do, you pray that spirit out on my way. Get behind me, Mazda. <laughs> Get behind me, Honda. Why? Because I am following that person. That's exactly what following the Holy Spirit is. Sometimes a little offense gets between you and the Holy Spirit and you got to drive that thing out. You got to come in closer, hunk on it a little bit, say come on get out, get out, get out, get out, get out. Well, get behind me devil. Why? I got to follow. I'm following the Holy Spirit. I'm trying to keep it close. My, I'm reading Michael Leonis' book on the Holy Spirit this week, listening to the audio and he shared a story where uh, Holy Spirit spoke to him one time. This one person left his church started their own church and in the dream God comes to, in the dream to Michael Ianos and he shares with him how the person who left the church is currently struggling financially and they cannot pay rent. He even like got the amount that he needs to that this person is struggling and God told him in the dream to pay the person who left this church their rent. So he woke up and he got so excited that God spoke to him in a dream and even gave him the numbers and who is struggling with what. He called that person, they didn't pick up the call, then they called him back and they said, how did you know that we were struggling? He said, in fact, when you called the first time, I was on the phone with our utility company because we can't pay rent, pay rent. we can't pay for our utilities. This is incredible, this is crazy. And Mike Julianos got so happy that God spoke that he forgot to pay their bill. It was three days later that God is like, I didn't tell you about their problem so that you can get happy that you heard my voice. They need money. <laughs> He's like, oh yeah, that's right. <laughs> my friend, disciple is not somebody who gets happy that God spoke. Disciple is somebody who acts on what he said. And so we, the problem with us is that we fall in love with God's voice. And many of us, we are not following God's leading. Because when you follow the Holy Spirit, this is where the secret and the key ingredients is. I love what Jesus said. In John chapter 15 verse 14, he says, You are my friends if you do whatever I commend you. Last year, when I was in London and we had a... Uh, I couldn't sleep the first night because of the jet lag and this scripture I was reading the scripture during the night and I got this revelation it's a very interesting revelation where obedience to the Holy Spirit is the key to friendship with him obedience to the Holy Spirit is the key to friendship with him now I have friends and you have friends I am pretty sure none of your friendships is based on this verse if you do what I say we are truly friends indeed your friend would be like excuse me where did you get the definition for that kind of friendship? We, we, no. What, what do you mean? That's not friendship. That's dictatorship. That's, that's like being a, a boss and an employee. No. But Jesus is using a different... See, most of us think friendship with the Holy Spirit is based on fellowship. It's based on obedience. You can talk your ear off to the Holy Spirit and you can listen to His voice and everything. But you will always remain the same if you don't follow Him and keep up with His speed in your life. He turns left, you go left. He turns right, you go right. If he goes forward, he speeds up, you speed up. So the key to that next level in the Holy Spirit is your obedience to the Holy Spirit. So after you feed on God's Word, you will begin to hear the voice of the Holy Spirit. It will be still, it will be quiet, it will be... You will know that He's speaking. And don't pray this prayer, God speak to me. Don't do that. Instead pray, say, God give me the strength when you speak to do. God will speak. It's just He usually doesn't start with things you want to hear. See most of us we think that when God will speak that means you'll know somebody's social security number who is standing right beside you in Starbucks. See that's a gift of prophecy but the speaking of God for your personal life it will not deal with people's numbers. It will deal with things in your heart and in your life in your finances that sometimes will cost you something. When I was younger I even fasted and said Lord speak to me. But personally, I discovered this. I stopped praying this a long time ago. And I said, my prayer now, Lord, say, give me strength when you do speak to act. Because when God does speak, I talk myself out of it. I find, I overthink it. 
and then this is what happens I minimize that voice and I said well this is just me talking this is just me speaking and then because I minimize that it gets quieter the next time and the more you minimize it it gets more quiet until it gets so quiet it becomes mute the same way as your computer can stop producing music even though it's playing because you clicked on mute every time you disobey the voice of the Holy Spirit it will get quieter 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 and you can sweat scream for God to speak to you but until you click mute button meaning until you start obeying what he says you will not hear his voice more and more the same way as if you're following somebody on a highway you get further and further and further what's what happens after about five minutes you will stop seeing them it's not because they're not on the road it's because the distance between you and them has gotten further and further and further in the beginning of this year as um, our board we have a board and we have a bylaws in our church and part of the bylaws in the church is that um, every person on the board and a, and a pastor needs to have their taxes being done by a professional not by their uncle in Ukraine <laughs> or Mexico and so and so one of the things that and, and I abide I have a board we, we don't run the church we run the church very structured and we have a people that oversee me and um, and so one of the things that I had to do this year is to go and do the taxes so when I went to do the taxes next thing that I realized is that they pulled up some things that turns out that's the way taxes my taxes were done and somebody else did them that were not done properly it saved me money but it wasn't done properly and the person who did looked at it they said uh bro this is not good and I was like well IRS is fine and I left and as I had a conversation with one person in the kitchen, the Holy Spirit started to speak and he says, you need to go redo the taxes and pay whatever you need to pay. And I said, Lord, it's government. They're not good. And the verse came to my mind, you shall pay Caesar. And it says that before it says, give to God. He says, you got the second part really good, Vlad. The first one, I said, Lord, I can give you all that money. I just want to give it to the government. And he says, it's not about giving me, it's about obeying me. But I'm going I'm to tell you something. And then I wrote the check. We didn't have that money right away. And to pay for my, or my mistakes or somebody else's mistakes, I'm going to tell you something. It was more painful to write the check to the government than the moments when me and my wife would empty our account and sometimes give two cars in the proximity of two months. Because when I give to God's kingdom, I know where it's going. When I give to the government, let's just say that I have my, my share of doubts. And the Holy Spirit was convicting me. He said, I said, seek my kingdom and my righteousness. You have to obey the voice of the Holy Spirit. M my friend, it's not about hearing the Holy Spirit. It's about heeding the Holy Spirit. This morning, I woke up. And the moment you know I woke up, some of you know that I have a, a build a, a website since I stopped traveling. I have a website and an online school that is going to start in about 30 days. And, and I sell you know books and ebooks on my website, partially to cover the expenses of the website and some of the commitments that I made to our church giving financially. And the moment I woke up, I wasn't thinking about it and I knew it was God. It was the same way as I've heard God before. I'm very careful when I say, I heard God. My pastor taught me never to use those words flippingly. But I heard the Lord say, give everything on your website for free and charge nothing. And I was like, you know, get behind me Satan. You know, because God can't be asking that. That's your work. You're working for it. Plus somebody needs to pay for the website. I go upstairs and my Bible is open like this, Ezekiel chapter 34. And my eyes go on the verse it says shepherds of Israel who feed themselves should not the shepherds feed the flock you eat the fat and clothe yourself with wool you slaughter the fatlings but you do not feed the flock I'm like never mind I go to my wife it was happened right here this morning and I said uh, babe I really feel because in mine I have four tests that I do when I hear the voice of God first one is I need to find it in the word if it's not in the word it's not God because Holy Spirit and the Holy Scriptures don't contradict. The second one is I look for peace right here. How do I feel? Do I feel tense? Do I feel peace? And number three is I ask my wife, what do you think? And wives are way more sensitive to the Holy Spirit than men. 
And so my wife would usually, if it's from God, she will confirm. And if it's not from Lord, she will say, just wait about it. And, and number three is that, number four is that you would give time. You would give time. And so, and I made a decision. And as of right now, all the stuff on the website, except the physical books, because they don't come for free for me, is they've been changed for free. Why am I sharing this? Not to brag it, but to give you an example. When Holy Spirit leads, you got to follow. That's what disciple is. He feeds and he follows. Stay close. My goal is to stay as close to the Holy Spirit as I can possibly can. I don't have certain gifts other people have. My goal is to be the best version of me that God called me to be and to stay as close to the Holy Spirit as I can. He might not give me your number to read but I want him to lead my personal life my family, my marriage and Holy Spirit might not give you the gift of prophecy but he will give you the gift of leading if you choose to follow him and his leading. Can somebody say amen? And lastly, disciple. So disciple feeds, disciple follows and thirdly, disciple forsakes that which hinders their follow. Disciple forsakes that which hinders their follow. Follow me and I will make you fishers of men. In Matthew 16 24 it says, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. I would like to share something with you that I believe is going to set some of you free. Do not worry about discipline, self-denial or the cross you need to carry. I don't see in the Bible Jesus inviting disciples to pick up their cross. He invites them to follow him. I don't see Jesus coming to the disciples and saying, I want you to forsake your boats, abandon your families. He invites them to follow him. So the goal of discipleship is not discipline, it's devotion. And once you follow, you begin to realize certain things you can't keep with you. Jesus didn't tell disciples abandon the boats. He just said follow me and as they were dragging the nets they're like I, I don't think I can carry that. Your follow decides your forsake. Your devotion will determine your discipline. See as you follow your follow will begin to decide and dictate. Hey I, I don't think you can take that anymore. I don't think you can keep that relationship anymore. I don't think you can talk to her like that anymore. I don't think you can spend money like that. Why? Because your follow decides your forsake. The goal is not forsake. The goal is follow. Our eyes supposed to be on Christ not the cross. Because as I follow Christ, I will end up being on the cross. But it's not because I want to be a martyr. It's because I'm a disciple. I'm going to read to you some quotes that some people think are said by Jesus. To conquer yourself is the greater victory than to conquer thousands in battle. And in the church you will say, Amen. He who is able, he who is able, he is able who thinks he is able. Praise God. The wise are disciplined in body, speech and mind. They are well controlled indeed. A disciplined mind brings happiness. No one can save us but ourselves. No one and no one may. We ourselves may walk in the path. The person who masters himself through self-control and discipline is truly undefeatable to enjoy good health, to bring true happiness to one's family, to bring peace to all, one must first discipline and control my own mind. You know who said that? Buddha. Christianity is not about discipline. It never was. Christianity is about devotion to the master. And that devotion, the moment that devotion grows, it begins to create discipline. Because you cannot follow without forsaking. But you can forsake without following. The world always, you will see people in the gym going at 4 o'clock in the morning. They are forsaking sleep, they are forsaking things, but they're not following Christ. And so what the church has bought into many times is Hinduism and Buddhism. Where simply it's all about discipline. It's all about if I just live right, my friend. That is not what Jesus is about. For Jesus it was always about follow me. I am the object of your worship. I am the object of your follow. I am your aim. I am your God. I am the one you follow. Not discipline. Not self-control. Not sinless.
blessed life. Jesus. Come on, somebody. Come on, somebody. Give God some praise. Give God some praise. My friend, for those of you who struggle with discipline, stop with discipline. Focus on Christ. Let Christ decide your discipline. Let follow decide your forsake. Please understand this message as I'm speaking with you is challenging for me too because by nature I am more disciplined and this is not in a proud way than the average people. I just and a lot of times I get convicted because the Lord was rebuking me. He says you're having an affair with me by cheating on me with discipline. It's just part of my personality. I'm just more disciplined. Just run. I wake up earlier and everything and it's easy to think I am a disciple because I'm disciplined. You're not. I'm not. Because you can be a disciple of Buddha if you're disciplined. But to be a disciple of Jesus means you're in love with the master and that love led people to be burned at the stakes. That love caused people to forsake boats and ships and not because they were trying to be disciplined. They just tried to be close. And so don't focus on being disciplined my friend. Focus on being close and I'm gonna promise you you'll be more disciplined than you will know what to do with. You will have more self-control because the fruit of the Holy Spirit is self-control. But please understand, it's not a fruit of your effort. It's the fruit of the Holy Spirit. That means your eyes are on the Holy Spirit. Your eyes are on the Master. Disciples will look to Jesus and because they follow Jesus, they said, this can't go, that can't go, that's slowing me down, that's too heavy. That relationship is too heavy. This attitude is too heavy. This habit is too difficult. I can't follow and drag this. I gotta forsake my net. I gotta forsake this. I gotta forsake that. Why? Because I wanna follow. I want to run after the Lord because Jesus is my aim. I want to keep up with Jesus. I want to stay near Jesus. I want to stay in love with Jesus. I will die if I have to. I will give my life if I have to because Jesus is the author. Jesus is the finisher of all my faith. Somebody give God some praise right now. Come on, every hand raised right now. Let's take a moment right now. Recommit your life to Jesus right now. God is raising up an army of disciples. God is raising up an army of disciples who will be in love with Jesus. Not in love with prayer. Not in love with the Bible, but in love with Jesus. Not in love with church attendance, but in love with Jesus. Not in love with not sinning, but in love with Jesus. Who will feed on His Word. Who will follow the leading of the Holy Spirit. And who will live a disciplined life because they live following Jesus. If you struggled with discipline, I just want to release you right now. And I just want to tell you that listen, discipline is not your struggle. Following maybe is your struggle. Get close. Redefine discipline for you as a Christian. Say, I want to live closer to Jesus. I don't want to just be more disciplined. Discipline is not bad. Being disciplined in your eating, in exercising, in your money spending is good. But discipleship is not about discipline. It's about devotion to the Master. It's about burning with love for Jesus. It's about loving Him more than your life. It's about loving Him more than your money. It's about loving Jesus more than your family. It's about loving Jesus more than yourself. It's about even if it needs to, to go and die for Jesus. Even if it needs to, to be to live for Jesus because Jesus, those who run the race, they leave aside every sin that easily ensnares them. They look to Jesus, the author and the finisher of their faith. They don't look to themselves. They look to Jesus. Precious Holy Spirit, we welcome you right now. Precious Holy Spirit, we ask you that you will fill us with the heart of Jesus. We ask you that you will redirect our attention to Jesus right now. In Jesus' name. I want you to say this with me. Say, oh Holy Spirit, redirect my focus to Jesus. I surrender my life to Jesus. I want to feed on His Word. I want to follow His Spirit. What He says, I want to do. And I want to be devoted. I want to see discipline as a result of me seeing Jesus. Every eye closed, every head bowed. If you're in this room today and you have not given your life to the Lord, maybe you have not committed your life to Jesus, maybe you have not repented of your sins and placed your trust in the saving blood of Jesus Christ, I would like to give you that opportunity. Maybe you're watching us on live stream and you don't know Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior. Would you give me the opportunity today to lead you to that relationship? 
as we celebrate the Father's Day. Maybe you've never had a physical father. God wants to be your father. He wants to be your father. All you got to do is repent of your sin. Place your trust in the Lord Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. And the Holy Spirit will come and live in you. God will take the heart of stone and give you the heart of flesh. And God will start a new relationship with you. You will have a church as your family. If you would like to make the decision today, pray this prayer out loud with me. Say, Lord Jesus, I am a sinner. Please forgive me of all my sin and wash me with your precious blood. I surrender my whole life to you. Come and live in me and be my Savior. In Jesus' name.